Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Health um, Harrow Health Matters um, event tonight. Um, today or tonight, we're, we're talking about emotional awareness, um, a topic that has always been um, an issue in our lives. Um, whether we realise it or not, uh, it touches on uh, such issues as anxiety, behavioural problems, uh, depression, stress, suicidal thoughts, and how we react to everyday life situations, and much, much more. Uh, and this is something that's not surprisingly come more to the fore since uh, COVID has turned our worlds upside down. And when things are turned upside down, the inevitable fallout that follows is just going to make life uh, so much more difficult for many people to cope and deal with. So who better to shed some possible uh, positive light and help on this, tap, on this topic and someone who can provide some helpful tips, answers and solutions to such problems and challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, you tonight to Kay Weave, emotional awareness expert, author, speaker, trainer and mentor to the Harrow Health Matters webinar to talk about helping to reduce the stress for parents, teachers and employers by developing a toolkit for talking and creating a safe space for teenagers and young, young adults to open up. Kay will share just a few of the insights on how she helps parents to mentor their own teens, uh, while sharing one or two tips on how to empower teenagers and young adults to take control of their own emotions for life, instead of letting their emotions control them. Kay is the author of a top-selling Amazon book called Brain Unchained, Emotional Awareness for Teenagers and Young Adults, Details of which you can find in the chat area and on the Hero Health Matters Facebook page. Uh, so welcome, Kay, and thank you so much for agreeing to share your expertise and experience of helping your son, Matthew, through some very challenging times uh, when you discovered that he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, or to give it its technical name, uh, ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. So for the benefit of our viewers, uh, Kay, what is Asperger's syndrome and ASD? And what does it actually mean in emotional terms? Uh, firstly, thank you for the lovely welcome. That's a nice big intro and, and nice to be here. And welcome to everybody on Harry Health Matters. Um, so yes, the, the autistic spectrum disorder is something that we didn't know about my son until he was about seven, eight years old. Um, so that was slightly later down, or later down his journey, but more at the beginning of his depression. And uh, autistic spectrum disorder means it's not fully autistic, it's not classed as autistic, um, but the Asperger's itself, it was discovered by a gentleman named Hans Asperger um, in the Northern European area, I can't remember if it was Norway, Denmark or Sweden, somewhere around that area. I can't remember which country, but it was in one of the Northern European countries. And uh, he'd recognised that there was these autistic traits that didn't lend to full-blown autism. Um, allowed people to still live a life where they could be around people and socialise, but they had social difficulties and they have difficulty with sensory perception. Um, and a good way of explaining the sensory perception is, for example, you and I, we can we can be in a room uh, filled with people in a party or a network meeting or something. And you can focus on the person you were talking to, like we're talking now. And you can filter out all of the other noise and movement and distractions going on around you and actually listen to that person. But for somebody who's on the autistic spectrum, they're trying to talk to you, listen to you, but they can hear everybody else talking. They can sense all the movement, the light, and, and they can't moderate those senses down to listen to the person in front of them. And in the same way, if you're in that moment and then somebody across the room calls your name, your senses would moderate to go, oh, you know, there's, there could be a hundred people talking, but when somebody calls your name, you pick up on it. But for them, it's like having that moment from everybody all at once while they're trying to focus. So it's overwhelming. And this is why they tend to either sit outside a party or an evening and um, say, so good evening, uh, Jeff and Kay from Jill there. So hi, Jill, nice to see you. And so, yeah, it's very um, difficult for them to <clears throat> be in, an, area, in an, an environment where the senses are overwhelmed. And for my son, that, in, that included the school environment where you've got lots of children talking and there's lots of colours around the room so he can see them out the corner of his eye. And it's like all this colours yelling and 
the light coming through the window or something would be a distraction and the child next to him trying to rub out their work while he's trying to write and it's shaking the table and people brushing past him and it was just complete overwhelm for him and it made it very difficult for him to access any social um, sort of time with other people because of this overwhelm. So, and there is a lot more to it than that. Um, there's also got a lot of good strengths as well. When they do focus on something or do decide to do something very well, they can be quite obsessive about it to a point of becoming really good at it. <laughs> um, and on sort of the, the fully autistic spectrum end of, of, of Asperger, or autistic spectrum on the fully end, sorry. I'll get that out right in a minute. Well, I'll spit my words out, put my teeth back in. Um, <laughs> when somebody is on the higher end, the other end of the autistic spectrum and they can be on the savant end, um, for example, people know about that gentleman named Kim who could like read a telephone book and remember every number but couldn't necessarily have a decent conversation with anybody unless there was somebody he was very, very close to in a, in a very routine environment. So it's, it's like it's not all black and white, but it's this entire scale from what autistic or what Asperger's people I've often heard referred to us. We get labeled as atypical and right. or, you know, we often get neurotypical or atypical. And we go from the neurotypical all the way through to full on autism. And there's just this entire spectrum in between. And there's there's no like set grades to it, which is why it's called autistic spectrum disorder. And right. my son was on the sort of there's a kind of a borderline in between that and atypical where they say somebody's more of a quiet, reclusive person, but not quite autistic spectrum. And my son was just over one side of the border. So he was not severe, but it was still enough that it affected his life. A bit like saying you've got a fractured leg. At least you haven't completely shattered it. But even a fracture is still enough to affect how you'd walk yeah. um, and it, it was still going to be painful and difficult to live with until it heals. But with autistic spectrum, it's never going to heal. They're going to have it for life. Mm. Right. Right. And it's interesting because you touched on the colours um, uh, and what have you. And I know in your book that um, uh, you come up with a colour strategy, which uh, is absolutely fascinating. Um, and you created that to help your son um, and to help him to learn about the emotions, well, for you, but for you, both him and yourself, um, yes. to you know, control his 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 emotions in that sense. So, um, can you can you sort of expand on that a bit, please, Kate? Because okay, uh, because I, I found yeah. that absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, yes, basically, it's the little di I always get the wrong hand. The little diagram that I've, we've put up here before starting yeah. is the diagram that Jeff is talking about with the colours, and I'll go into that a bit more in a bit. Um, what it was is actually right from the age of eight was when my first, uh, my son, oh my goodness, my son, son first tried to take his life um, because of the depression. Uh, he came out of school one night and he actually ran and tried to run in front of a car. And initially you just think, oh, it's a child is ran, they're not paying attention to the road. But what I hadn't expected, I literally just caught the hood of his coat and stopped him literally inches short of the car tyre. Right. As the car screeched to a halt, it was all like really close. And, you know, you kind of expect him to go, oh, and sort of shocked and cry. And, it, you know, you expect it, you, you know, when a child has suddenly been like, oh, I'm going somewhere and then gets stopped suddenly and there's this disruption, you can expect some tears because it's a bit of a shock to the emotions. But what I hadn't expected was what I got when he turned around to me and screamed at me in front of all the other parents. Why did you stop me? Why didn't you let me die? I don't want to live anymore. And he screamed at me like that the whole way home. Um, and that was the first time he he really genuinely tried to take his life at eight years old. Okay. Um, it wasn't the first time he'd talked about being depressed um, or wanting to die. The first time he'd said he wanted to die was actually when he was about five. And you kind of don't really take it that seriously at that point. You kind of you, you know they're in a bad day and you think, oh, they're saying that, but they don't really understand. Um, but but to have actually attempted with the intention of taking his life at eight was, was a real shock to me. Yeah. You know, you, you question yourself, oh my God, what am I doing wrong as a parent? You know, why is my son like this? Why did I not see that coming? Or somehow my instinct just kicked in enough to grab him. But um, you, you do question yourself about what am I doing? And we were already trying to get him diagnosed for the Asperger's. Um, I think it was around that, that time of the diagnosis. So we suspected it was there. 
Um, we'd already had a lot of problems with him in school, trying to get him to do his school work and actually pay attention and focus because he couldn't focus with all the distractions. He was finding it difficult to make and keep friends in school. Some he could, but some he couldn't. There, there were some difficulties there. And this just built up to the point that from that day, he was suicidal every single day for the following year. And then through the education system, we weren't able to get a diagnosis because we'd done it privately through the doctors. And the education system a year later sent us a letter saying he didn't even need a diagnosis uh, or an assessment. Sorry, they refused to even assess him. Um, so we were banging the heads on the brick wall by this point. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, I home educated him because um, and I don't want other people to have to get there if they can avoid that um, as, a, as a case of feeling like it's their only choice. But with Matthew, we felt that was the only choice we had. And then it's the, this. We had a couple of better years and then teenage hormones kicked in and we had a real emotional crash. Yeah. And it got to a point at 19 years old, <clears throat> I then, after teaching him at home for seven years, I got to a point I didn't know what else to do. And I thought he needed 24-7 support because he'd then gone really suicidal and quite aggressive with it as well. So we'd actually put him in a hostel. And I, that was one of the worst days of my life having to make that decision. Um, because I, we had to throw him out technically first and, and almost sort of make him, well, I did that. That was the main thing is I threw him out. Um, and he'd got to that point where he said, I'm not taking my problems outside this house. And, you know, as a lot of parents will realise um, and, and associate with, there are teenagers out there who are struggling with depression and they won't get help because they see it as a stigma or a weakness to get help. Um, they think they're going to be judged for it. They're, there's also fear behind it of their school friends finding out or or ha if it is going to make them worse or having to face up to emotions when they get there that they don't want to talk about, things that they might be hiding from parents. So there's all these things going on in their head on top of the depression um, that stop them from wanting to get help. And that's where he was. So even when we got him to a psychiatrist, on one occasion, it took me five months to get an appointment. And then the day I got him to the psychiatrist, he was having a better day and just sat there and said, there's nothing wrong. I don't know what mum's on about. She's making it all up. I'm mm -hmm. fine. So the, the, literally, I tried to talk to the psychiatrist myself and she just kept ignoring me. It was almost like she didn't want me in the room. And she said to Matthew, well, I think you're fine. I don't need to see you anymore. We'll write you off the books. And she literally dismissed him from the system. And yeah. I was fuming. I was so mad. Um, so, yeah, I did have my own emotions to deal with as well, you know, like yeah. stress of one thing and watching him all the time when he was suicidal and having to sort of walk on eggshells when he was feeling more aggressive and not that he actually did anything to hurt me, he threatened yeah. a few times, but um, I'd always kept very, very strong boundaries as well that um, I thought was very, very important, even with the autistic spectrum, with the depression, I thought it was always really, really important for the family to keep boundaries that he if he ever did actually hurt anybody i would call the police yeah and i always made that really clear and i thought it was very important to stick to that boundary got close once or twice but we never quite got there but he knew that if he took that one step further that i would have done it and i i had to be quite firm with that because of protecting everybody in the house yeah. um so yeah thank you so we got some comments somebody said sorry okay that's that's fine you know it's it's all it's all part and parcel of what we're here to share now and inspire other people to to come through this and transform from it in in a better way than we had to struggle through it so um the, the great thing is now matthew's aware that everything i do i do because it will help other people and he supports me talking about it um a completely different story now um but anyway so it got to a point at 19 he was living in this hostel and then he went downhill even more and at 19, he couldn't even tell you what day of the week it was. Um, he, he was just like completely shut off from the world, disconnected with life. And when we, we make jokes about teenagers being like zombies, it, I really remember standing there one day looking at this body in front of me and thinking, he looks like my son. But it's like I can barely see a semblance of my son in there anymore. Wow. I know I know he's in there. And it's almost like when you're trying to bring somebody... And, and when you've seen a teenager in that stage, in that state, it's almost like sometimes I've seen these absolutely horrible, horrid news articles um, where people in religious cults in other countries have taken their children to exorcists when they've been in this state, had them flogged and everything. And I'm like, 
I can understand why, um, not because you want to punish them, because they want to help them, but it's not the right way to deal with it. Absolutely, 100% not the right way to deal with it. Um, yeah. But I could understand seeing my son like this and thinking, where is he? I could see the body, but where's, where's Matthew? Yeah. And it was just in sheer desperation. How, you know, how can I get him to understand his own emotions? Because I was like his emotional paramedic 24 seven. I was trying to, by now I'd, I'd got a career again. I was in a, in a full time job. And that was quite stressful in itself, the job I was in. It was a very sort of high buzz, high energy job. Yeah. And then after work, I was very often spending two or three hours coaching him out of this depression. And I just, I was burnt out. I, I didn't know where to go from here. I, I'd exhausted all options with the diet, the exercise. You know, we'd done the martial arts when he was younger. We'd had the trampoline in the garden. We'd done the supplements. We'd had psychologist therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, because at some point when they're younger with the autistic spectrum, and by the way, when I'm talking about the emotional side, this is relevant to all children, not just those on the autistic spectrum. Um, that was just an additional problem that my son had. Um, it was all of these things going on and all these things we tried, but we were no further down the line. We'd actually seemed to have gone downhill even further. And I needed to make a change, mm. needed yeah. something to change. And that was where the color <laughs> going the right way around. That's where the colors came in. <clears throat> and to start with, it wasn't this diagram. It was, I literally wrote the four colors on a piece of paper one day, yellow, red, blue, and black. And I started there and I had a conversation with him about each of those colors in terms of emotions and what that meant to him. And we spent about an hour just talking about those four colors. And it was going through, so for example, happy, what does happiness mean in terms of color? And we talked about how everyone says when you're happy, it's like the sun shines from you or you feel on top of the world. And, you know, we talk about fluffy ducks and, you know, everything's bright and happy and cheerful and sunflowers and, you know, yellow jacket. I love wearing a yellow jacket to feel happy. And yellow seems to be this really sunny, happy, cheerful color. And you hear people talking about if you want to change your mood, change what you wear. And there's a reason behind it. <laughs> it's not just a case of it's woo woo. And if you do it, it's just trying to sell more fashionable items. There is a real science behind it. But this diagram, I will get it right by the end of the show, this yeah. diagram, because I'm used to sitting on that side of the show and have the circle the other end. And <laughs> I'm on the other end of the show today. Yeah, um, just, just, just above your, le your left shoulder, Ken. That one. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we were talking about all the happiness and what that means. And when he was happy, what that meant to him, how he felt. Yeah. And then we talked about the sadness and sadness. We talk about uh, sadness in terms of I like to think of it as anything to do with thoughts in the blue. Anything that's not actually action based, but it's thought based. And we talk about emotions being like water where they flow, emotions flow. And then we talk about thoughts being like air. And people already use these analogies. This is not something I'm making up. So I'm, I'm studied what people actually say and think and feel. And this is where eventually I converted it to the diagram. Um, but we, we looked at what that meant to him. So when you're thinking of something, thoughts are air and emotions are like water. So it's all blue. But the yeah. deeper you go with your emotions, the deeper that blue would get. I've only got one color on the diagram, but you've got to kind of imagine it would go from bright blue sky all the way down to sort of reflection on the sea and down into the depths, into the darkness. Yeah. And when you're getting down into the real depths and darkness of that blue is where you're touching into the black of depression and you start going into that. And the same on the other side, when you're looking at the anger, we talk about red rag to a bull, red mist, boxing gloves like red where they punch each other, power games. Yeah. And and again, it's also from very positive end of action. When you are doing a positive action, it's like motivation. So that's up towards the yellow in, in the red. Yeah. But when you are taking negative action, you're going down towards the black and you're down towards that depression again. But on the aggressive side, that's when the aggression comes out. So it's action. But action positively is motivation, whereas negatively you're getting in this aggression. 
So it's about teaching him how to understand these moods. And it took a while for me to come up with this diagram. And then obviously, in the end, we talk about um, depression as being in the pits, rock bottom, stuck in a rut, yeah, and yeah. Being, living in darkness. And all I was doing was listening to what, the way the world already talks about emotions yeah. and recognising that actually, yeah, happiness is up. Depression is down. And the only two way between happiness and depression is to go through sadness or anger. Something in the red or something in the blue. So if it's in the blue, it could be grief, like losing a loved one. Yeah. It could be somebody taking something away from you, like losing a job even. Um, like people who come out of retirement have had a lifelong of being happy. They're fine. They've got the purpose. They love their job. And then they retire. And if they haven't planned for it, they can hit that depression quite quickly as well with um, like, I've lost, you know, lost their way of life and they don't know how to deal with it. And yeah. I thought they were ready for it and think, oh, I'll sit back and relax. And actually sitting back and relax is a positive end up there. But if you're not ready for it, you just start to sink and sink again. Yeah, yeah. So just understanding all these dynamics that everybody already uses and saying that if you could see it, this is what it looks like. Because when Matthew couldn't even tell me the day of the week and he couldn't, connect with money he couldn't connect with measurements like times and weights if he was struggling with anything that was a concept how was i supposed to teach him to manage his own emotions yeah fair. and that's where the questioning in my head began there's got to be a way and he needs to see something but there was nothing out there the only thing out there is this is sort of like sine wave of the emotional cycle which is in a lot of psychology books that's got all these little labels on about the different phases of emotions you go through, which is great if you are studying psychology, counselling, NLP coaching, any other therapy, and you as a therapist are using that sine wave to support a client, that's great. Yeah. But for a teenager who's refusing to go and see anybody for help, refusing to talk to parents, how are we supposed to teach this to them? Yeah. So that is where... I really said he needs a way to see this. And it all sort of gradually came out. But within months, he just changed so rapidly. Um, at the time, I didn't do it for any other purpose than to save my own son and to take some stress off of me. That yeah. was the original purpose behind it. So, uh, yeah. I was going to say, Kate, yeah, when, say she started, questions, yeah. when she started working together yeah, on, on this kind of concept, mm. was that the start of... Um, you know, the uh, um, getting to the bottom and, and helping him and, and for Matthew to realise that he can actually, there's a way out, if you like, of, of, of what he was going through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he changed rapidly um, within, literally within a couple of weeks, I started to see him stop talking about committing suicide again. Uh, he was still having sort of dipped in depression because originally I'd been perhaps taking two or three hours to talk him out of a, a depression, you know, when he was feeling suicidal and getting him back to what I'd call safe ground, not necessarily happy ground, but at least safe ground. And then over the, the over literally a matter of weeks, that two or three hours dropped down to about an hour. So that was a big reprieve for a start. So don't expect like overnight miracles, but it's just keep going in stages. It's like, like, again, talk if you heal broken a leg, it's not just going to heal overnight. It takes time. Yeah. So you have to go through that process. And then one day, oh, it must have been sort of a few months down the line, he rang me up and said, oh, mum, I just had another depression. Like, he'd hit another real low. Yeah. But he'd recognised it. And because what I sort of taught him was that if you're not living in one of these emotional states, you will be in the other three. The only yeah. way you're not in one of these four is if you're not on the planet Earth. <laughs> um, all the time you're alive, you are in one of those emotional states. So that a lot of a lot of people don't believe in pos all this positive thinking and this this empowerment stuff. But actually, this diagram, <laughs> this diagram, gives them a better understanding of why it's important. Because if you're not thinking positively up towards that yellow, you will be thinking negatively. Yeah, that's yeah. the only two choices yeah. unless there's something where you're neutral in the middle and it's not something you're thinking about 
you know, if they're, they're 13 years old and you haven't yet asked them their opinion on rocket science, they might be neutral on that. But anything that's relevant in their life, if they're not thinking positive, they will be thinking negatively. Yeah. So it's about helping them to recognize that, that actually the power of positive thinking is only in their hands. It's up to them to embrace that and to recognize that and yeah. to give them that empowerment to do that on their own, but support them through the process, of course. Yeah. And say he changed so rapidly that say one day he then rang me up and he said, yeah, I just had another depression one, but I talked myself out of it in 10 minutes. Wow. I was like, wow, that was like, oh, a sigh of relief for me that day. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that was such a powerful moment. I never forgot it to hear him say that. Yeah. And yeah. then quite quickly, I then saw the friends that he was hanging around with. Some of them, as always, when you make changes in life, there are some friends who are toxic who will not like it. And they're yep. the ones that will gradually get cut out of your life. And you know what? Embrace that too, because that's a good thing. <laughs> if somebody's being toxic in your life, you don't want them in your life. But yep. all the friends that were valuable to him, that, that loved him for who he was, even when he was in a depression, aggressive, angry, moody state, yeah. The friends that loved him, they stayed with him. And actually one day this, this friend walked into a coffee shop where we were having a coffee, sat down with us, <laughs> as they do. They don't they don't ask permission as teenagers now, just walk in and sit down with you, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so while we're having coffee, his friend turned around and says, I've realised that hanging around with Matt makes me a better person. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I know Matthew had been supporting his friends as well, and he'd secretly been asking me questions about how to advise them. Not that I'd literally advised them and it wasn't, wasn't like an, an authoritative thing. Yeah. And he's like, oh, so, so he keeps asking me this and I don't know how to deal with it. What should I say? Sort of thing, you know, because his yeah. friends started looking up to him. And so I said, oh, my goodness, if this is having that much of an effect in months, I need to do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That, that, that must have been, you know, a, a couple of breakthroughs like that came must have been really sort of. Yeah, you know, must have made you feel really proud, uh, and, and yeah. just to see Matthew sort of develop. Well, I suppose at that age he's developing into a young man. At the same time, um, so that's that's yeah. really. So, so what what um, what's your number one tip then, Kay? That that you would share with viewers to help parents and teachers and health professionals uh, to identify these e emotional states. Um. To identify the emotional states is would literally would be <clears throat> get the book and learn about this emotional cycle because yeah. it teaches you, you know, I give us a one number one tip. It it's about understanding that every action, reaction, and interaction that they have every single day is based on an emotion. So actually embracing the concept of emotional awareness is the key to not growing older and wiser, but growing wiser before growing older. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's about really getting ahead on the game and giving them a head start on life. Yeah. Um, but the number one tip for me above anything else is never, ever, ever give up on them. I've heard so many parents at times say, oh, I give up. I don't know what to do. I'm just leaving them in the bedroom. They don't come out unless it's for a meal or to grunt or slam the door again. Yeah. I don't know what to do and they give up yeah. but for me it was so important not to give up I, I always said no I'm not giving up I need to find a way to help my son what else can I do there must you know there must be something how can I teach him to manage his own emotions so instead of saying I give up which automatically shuts your brain off from looking for answers yeah. we've all got this reticular activating system where if you ask a question it'll be looking for the answers that's how your brain works but if you shut your brain off and say, I give up, it stops. It starts filtering everything out and it's like I'm not looking for it anymore. So you're yeah. never going to find the answer. And that was where I kept seeking and seeking answers until I realized that he needed to see a visual way to learn about emotions. And it is such a hypothetical thing normally when we talk about emotions. Yeah. It's just this, how, how do you explain to somebody how to control their emotions? You know, especially a depressed teenager. So it's basic is where it all came from. So, um, but yeah, my, my key tip is never, ever, ever give up. There's always hope. Yeah, no, that's, 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 hope. Good, that's good. And and with the two of you having embarked on a uh, on what I could only describe as as a journey, uh, is 
take you both to hell and back on, on numerous occasions, mm. the sounds of it. And and yeah, how was you, how was Matthew today? And and if you want to share, yeah, the, the relationship that the two of you have now, having gone through that journey. Oh goodness, he is a completely different lad. He's 26 now, so com compared to he was 19, 18, 19 when I started developing this, he's now 26. Um, he's kept a solid job down for four years, and then he left that last year to take his HGV. But Thanks. his HGV, yeah, he actually went on to take his HGV last year. Now, yeah. at the age of 19, where he was, I couldn't have imagined that. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it got postponed and postponed, and he eventually took it in September, and he missed it. He had one minor and one major. So if he hadn't made that one major mistake, he would have gone through with an almost perfect record. Couldn't have imagined that for him six years ago. No. Um, but because he missed it, he's still waiting for the retest, which should be sometime this month. Um, mm. But in the meantime, he got a job in a factory. And again, I was thinking, oh, this could be interesting. Busy, noisy factory, lots of people, lots of orders going on, sticking to deadlines. Um, I thought this could be interesting, but we'll see how it goes. And oh, my word, he was on a three month trial. And eight weeks in, he was offered a pay rise for conscientious work reaching production targets and supporting other staff as well. <laughs> They'd noted how well he was getting on with everybody. Yeah. And he's now got his full-time contract. So he's now actually in a, in a contractor position. Good. And he's um, in the process, I'm hoping to hear this week, he's in the process of applying for a job to train other members of staff. They've asked him to apply for the job to train other members of staff. Wow. I'm like, I really couldn't have imagined that for him six years ago. You know, yeah. he, he was... He was in such a state. I was, I can remember one night actually sitting in the car outside the hostel with him and he was so bad, so yeah. bad. We'd actually got the phone out, we'd got on the internet and we'd looked up the number for the local psychiatric unit and was on the point of driving the car to the nearest centre to actually get him admitted. We were that close. Wow. Um, when we, we started to make these breakthroughs by, by starting this diagram. We were so close, and there's just got to be a way to turn this around, Matthew. You yeah. know, we, we were literally like 20 seconds away from ringing up to admit him. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. Um, and yet now, and no medication involved in this process at all. And I'm not saying that everybody should come off medication. Please don't. If you're on it, stick with it and do what your doctor, <laughs> doctor sort of advises because there's dangers of that as well, both on it and off it. So, so be careful with that. I'm not advising that. Um, but for him, because of the autistic spectrum disorder, when he did try dis antidepressants on one occasion, he yeah. had quite a bad reaction to them. So he had to come off them again. Um, so that didn't help either. So we had to do the non-medication route. And yeah. But yeah, after all those years, I didn't expect him to recover the way he did. And now he's so resilient. Yeah. And he's got he's got a little girl. Actually, I can just show briefly in here. Uh, this was him four years. It was four years ago now, but that's my son now. Wow. Uh, that was the day I, I did a stage talk. He yeah. came to support me. And that's his little girl. Oh. And she's so three years old. Yeah. And she yeah. wanted to reach his pull-up bars. And she was so determined that she couldn't reach. She went and got this tiny little stool, like that's going to help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she stood on that stool so desperate to reach them. And uh, so I put on there, don't ever let anyone tell you your goals are out of reach. <laughs> oh, that's, brilliant. that's brilliant. So that's my granddaughter. So this this is the book, by the way. The book is Brain Unchained. And yeah. uh, the diagram is on the back because there are two versions, a full colour copy. So the few, the few diagrams that are inside are in full colour in the full colour copy. Yeah. Um, because it's very expensive to do full colour, it's there. It's, it's great if you want that. It's a good gift one um, if you want to gift it to somebody. Yeah. Um, but there is also a black and white version, which is why the diagram's on the back cover, to make it more cost effective for the black and white color cover. Yeah, that, that's white fair. Interior, so. But um, but Matthew's confidence must have gone. You know what's been happening with him recently, and, and you know, and, and mm. his confidence must must have gone right right up. Okay. Absolutely, and it's incredible. Um, I, I just can't believe how resilient he is. And he's actually been my rock this last year because I went through, uh, sorry, somebody says kind of repeat the name of the book. It's So it's called Brain Unchained. And what we'll do is I'll put a link to the website in the chat afterwards and um, because yeah. I can't type it in through StreamYard, so we'll have to do it through the uh, uh, Facebook Facebook group. Um, but it's kreeve.co.uk. And then the link to the book is on there in colour, black and white, 
and then it's in Kindle. And if you can read it for free if you're on Kindle Unlimited. And uh, you're welcome. And all the links to all the countries are in there as well, because available in 13 different countries. Wow. Um, <clears throat> wow. It just, no, sorry, because say just amazing to see that journey that he's been through. But just very briefly say, the, the day that I knew we were safe was the day that he put his arm around me. We sat on a bench in the sunshine in town, just talking, and he put his arm around me and he said, I want to thank you for never giving up on me. He said, I know what a pain in the ass I've been. <laughs> Sorry, it's good to swear with. Um, to quote what he said, he said, but I wouldn't be the man I am now, he said, if you hadn't thrown me out and you hadn't helped me through and you hadn't stuck by me. And uh, he said, this is what he said that made me realise he got the, the diagram, like he got the, the process. He said, I now know why steel is forged in the fire. He said, the more you go through it, the tougher you get. And I thought, he's got it. He is ready to embrace life, and he has. Yeah. He yeah. has. Oh, that's yeah. excellent. Oh, that's brilliant. That's yeah. great. Thanks ever so much for sharing that, Kay. And there's loads You're of welcome. There for, for people to, to pick up on. And um, I mean, we'll open it up to the floor. I don't know if there's any questions. I've, there's, I've got a bit of a technical hitch here, unfortunately. I, I can't see any questions. All oh, right. I can see some from here. So, yeah, um, thank you very much to everybody's comments. We've got... Uh, Obviously, good evening earlier from Jill. We had hi everyone. Uh, good evening, Jeff and Kay. Uh, good evening. So somebody said sorry. That's think that's that's fine. And um, the main thing is, is even for Matthew, he understood that what we went through um, is not wasted if it's going to inspire other people. We, you know, it, it was a tough childhood for him, and I do sometimes wish I could give him his childhood over a lot happier. Um, but he says to me, no, he said, it's 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 what's made him who he is now. And if it inspires other people to keep going and, and to make that connection with the teenagers and help other teenagers transform a lot quicker than he did through that process, he said, then it was worth it. And he's he's really grateful. So he's he's a mate. Oh, my God, I couldn't, I couldn't be more proud of him. I really couldn't. No, that's good. Um, that's good. So, that's yeah. Good. yeah, excellent. Excellent. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Then, I don't know if there's any questions any other questions coming through Kay um, no the only other one was some, uh, somebody's put uh, so we've got a Facebook user it says here uh, bless you your hard work has paid off thank you very much indeed and yeah, I think that, I think that's Varsha actually in the background she put the, the link in for us as well so hi Varsha <laughs> and this, so she'll be watching along so I think that's who that is excellent thanks Varsha um, um, yeah that's um, uh, I, I mean I, I, I think Lots of people must have found that very inspirational. Okay, I certainly found it inspirational. And I love the idea as well that you, you took a practical approach, um, you know, with the, with the colours and, and, and everything. And, and um, obviously, yeah. then able to work. It's almost as if you worked together as a team after that, wasn't it? Yes, uh, I pretty much did in a way. I mean, it was say, yes, we did and we didn't. He still had his life to build and, and so on. So um, I worked with him through developing the original diagram, but it was more not so much him inputting, but me developing that and then using that. Initially, it helped me to have those conversations with him. Yeah. And it, it gave me the skills for actually listening because, sorry, the bit I didn't touch on, we talked about the four emotions up there, the four core emotions, but the little inner and orange outer rings, the, outer, the orange and outer, yeah. inner and outer, is about change. Because the one thing I realise, we've got the four different emotional states. But the only reason we change between emotions is because something changed, whether it's something positive or something negative. And so then I had to go down a whole second route where there's a whole second strategy in the book for understanding change. So the book is divided into three chapters. One is about the four core emotions. One's about the orange inner and outer circles with change. And then the third chapter is all about understanding the root causes. So that's the strategy for the book. And then using that to reverse engineer um, a positive change and, yeah. and setting positive challenges, goal setting, all that sort of thing. Um, so it's also set out like, oh, sorry, like the microphone. Yeah. Um, also all the way through set out. So there's lots of pages in there as well that are like workbooks. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. to let people know. As well as, as well as, if I can find one quickly, there's lots of quotes, analogies, short stories, and things. But also at the end of every section, in there is a parent toolbox. Yeah. Um, which is great because every lesson in there is then backed up by that parent toolbox. 
So if a teenager like my son was not ready to sit down and I didn't have the book, you've got it easy now, it's in the book. I yeah. had to write the book. <laughs> um, but it was, it, it was initially me having the tools to be able to open up that conversation with him and get him to talk. And it gave me the skills to listen in, to listen. Is he talking about something, being happy, sad, angry, depressed, listening to what changed and then asking him the right questions. What changed? What can you do about it? How can you turn that back? So to start with, it gave me the tools by developing the strategy and yeah. then teaching it to him as I went along. Wow. Um, but thank you. Oh, I love your analogy. She said, thank you very much. Excellent. But that, it, it sounds as though you've actually got a, a very practical blueprint there, uh, Kate. Not, yeah, not just for you know, parents and teachers, but for health and wellness professionals as well. Yeah, that, that, that yes. deal yeah. with with these types of issues, and yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. It'd be interesting to see what sort of reaction you get from those professionals. Um, yeah, with regard to helping them, obviously in, in, in their work. So, I mean, if if there's no more mm. questions that come have come through, yeah. Claire, there is uh, one more. Um, yeah. Somebody's asked, how can we use this in relation to the feelings uh, during coronavirus time? Um, again, it's just about understanding uh, if, if a teenager has got extra anxieties about going back to school or, or fears or they're angry about something. Um, if it is about the coronavirus, what, what is it they're worried about? What are they angry about? Are they, you know, are they worried about losing somebody? They're worried about the social distancing at school or, yeah. um, you know, all the extra rules in place. Are they afraid that the teachers are going to be more strict and shouting all the time because they've stepped out of line or something? You know, most a lot of kids go to school with that fear of getting told off anyway. The, the, that, I can't think of the term of it now, I've gone blank, but the sort of fear of being told off or, or put in your place or thing. Yeah. And uh, sort of some just don't like that confrontation in any form. My daughter hates confrontation of any sort. Yeah. Um, and yet she can really stand up for herself, which is quite funny, really. <laughs> she used to stand up for her brother, bless her, when he was little. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, lots of ways it can be used. But initially, and this is just the first book of many I've got in my head, as you say, is going to be a lot more versatile. Yes. But initially, I know any year as it is, any teenager is already struggling. Um, you think they're only a teenager for six years. I, from 13 to 19, they're a teenager. And during that time, they've got to deal with the social changes of moving into the teen years. Um, they've got to deal with hormonal and body changes. They've got to deal with their school career options, um, dealing with any social anxieties and issues at school with bullies and all yeah. the social circles. And, on, and today, which we wouldn't have had, is all the social media issues as well. Yeah. Then on top of that, by the time they reach 19, they are legally allowed... Um, to smoke, drink, drive, get married, have a baby and vote. <laughs> and all of that. And then you throw the pandemic on top and then dealing with uh, additional choices for college, university, trying to find careers and find their way in life. And it's oh my God, that would, in six years, I'd struggle with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's it, like, no wonder they get overwhelmed. And I think we, it's so easy to think teenagers have it easy and forget actually how much they've got to, transform time after time after time and all those anxieties in such a short part of their life i think yeah. we need to give them a little bit more compassion and a bit more support <laughs> yes yeah excellent excellent yeah. okay Kate, well, well, well thank you ever so much for sharing your story uh Kay, for highlighting well not just the problem of asperger's and, and asd but also providing practical steps to solutions for other parents that can give them the skills yeah, the knowledge and the renewed yeah. hope as you, as you said there at the end that what may be perceived at times as a an insurmountable obstacle uh, can actually be um, overcome successfully um ladies and gentlemen uh, you can get Kay's book brain unchained um emotional awareness for teenagers and young adults from amazon as uh Kay mentioned earlier by clicking on the url link uh, which will be in the in the chat box somewhere at some stage um, and in the comments on the Harrow Health Matters Facebook page. Um, Kay, would you like to have one final say before we wish everyone a good evening? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, to be honest, I think uh, very quickly before I do, I've got one final word I want to leave on. Um, I think Ms. Varsha, again, she put in, could the colour 
will be used by counsellors or therapists. Absolutely. And a bit further down the line, because at the moment I've only just published the book in January. So it's early days for me. Um, yeah. So we're still developing the business strategy behind it. But at some point down the road, I'd like to get this license that it could be um, certified and used as a plug on to other therapies. Um, so that is a, a dream in my head coming up in the future, but we're not quite there yet. But in yeah. terms of that, yeah, it would definitely work. Um, at the end of the day, I believe that the whole point of this is that parents make the best mentors for the teenagers because they're the ones that are there for them every single day. Counselors and therapists do amazing work, and this is not about undermining them, but they are not in that teenager's life every single day. Parents are. And yeah. that's why I focus on doing this from a parent's teenager point of view, this first book. Yeah. And also, uh, Vash has asked, congratulations on the upcoming TV interview. Can you tell us how we can watch this? Yes. Okay. Um, I will pop a link in the chat afterwards. But yes, I had a text message yesterday morning. This is for the viewers in general. Um, I'd had a conversation on Monday to invite me to an interview on TV on the 30th of July and I woke up to a text message yesterday morning asking me to move it forward to this Friday. So it will actually be at midnight. So for me, technically, it's Saturday, but it'll be midnight tomorrow night and I will drop the link down below because it will also come up with a replay on YouTube or Facebook afterwards. Um, but it's on an American TV channel, which is called the Dr. Jacqueline um, stories of hope inspiration and overcoming adversity i think i think it's something like that it was quite a long title yeah. um but i'll drop the link in the yeah. final word i'd like to say is based on the fact that with the diagram the reason we change between emotions is because something changed is you know i said about matthew's little quote about the steel and the fire i've come up with a quote that is mastering life is all about mastering change and that is the strategy that i teach through the book yeah yeah that, that's thank so, but it's, thank you so much for having me on the show tonight jeff and interviewing me it's been amazing having a chat with you thank you no you're welcome i've, I've found it absolutely fascinating i'm hoping that all our viewers have found, mm -hmm. found it fascinating and, and there's loads of gold nuggets mm -hmm. dropped in there kate so thanks ever so much once again and um at this stage both kay and myself would like to wish everyone say thank you for joining us hope you enjoyed it or i'm sure you did and wish you all uh, a very good evening and um uh, a nice weekend that's coming up. Cheerio, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.